Hey all, thanks, uh, thanks all for coming. We're, we're super excited to get started. So my name is uh, Surya Ganguly, but I'd like to introduce uh, first my co-organizer, Percy Liang. He's a professor in the CS department at Stanford and a director for the Center for Research on Foundation Models, which is doing seminal work in the science, technology, and societal implications of foundation models, which has so revolutionized uh, AI in recent years. In fact, they named the term foundation models. All right, thanks, Surya. And Surya Ganguly is a professor of applied physics and uh, associate director of HAI. He works at the intersection of theoretical physics, machine learning, and neuroscience. He's interested in understanding and improving how neural circuits work, which includes biological circuits, such as brains, artificial circuits in silico, and even quantum neuromorphic circuits based out, based out of uh, atoms and photons. So I'm going to have to ask you about that later. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Rishi. So I'd also like to introduce you to Rishi uh, Bomasani. Uh, do you want to stand, stand up? Um, say hi. Yeah. So Rishi's a fantastic graduate student at Stanford. Um, he's a society lead for uh, CR, CRFM. And Rishi's a co-organizer of this conference with us. And you'll be hearing a, a lot from him uh, in the afternoon sessions where he'll be moderating a, a fantastic panel. OK, I also want to thank uh, Vanessa Parley, um, um, who is a director of research at HAI, who uh, really helped us uh, with um, organization of this conference, and Casey Peel, who did over there, um, who did a huge amount of work um, doing the logistics and all the organizational aspects of the conference. So none of this would be possible without her. So thank you, Casey. Thanks. OK, so we'd like to start by uh, marking the nature of the historic moment uh, that we find ourselves in by kind of taking a long-term perspective. Right, so um, how do I go to the next slide? Yeah, there we go. So um, you know, indeed, many moments of immense import uh, for, the, for the simultaneous advance of science, technology, and society can be traced back to the invention of new instruments. Uh, which enable us to peer into the very nature of reality in fundamentally new ways that we never could before. For example, the invention of the microscope, the left one is Hooke's microscope from the 1600s, and the right one is a scanning tunneling microscope, electron microscope. They enabled us to peer into both the world of biological uh, microbes and the physical world of materials, even at the nano scale. And these new windows into nature provided fundamentally new technologies, like new drugs for targeting pathogens, and new materials with remarkable properties through sculpting matter itself at the nanoscale. We do believe that with recent advances in AI unfolding over the last few years, we are living in a similar historic moment, ripe with the potential for advancing science, technology, and society, precisely because AI allows us to see nature and humanity in fundamentally new ways. Just as a microscope made visible new structure at tiny scales, invisible to human perception, AI makes new structure in high dimensional patterns a visible, a structure that is, this is, that is completely invisible not only to direct human perception, but also initially invisible even to direct human thought. Right. So, so that's, uh, that's our icon for AI. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, this unprecedented ability of AI, in particular generative AI, to sift through high dimensional patterns to discover structure, and even to imagine never before seen structures has opened up new opportunities for, and questions in science, human creativity, and the nature of human society. Yeah, I really like the microscope analogy because it illustrates how fundamental of a shift this is for us. So AI, especially with foundation models, uh, allows us to see the world differently. And so that's why when Syria and I were talking about how to organize this conference, we decided to make it about new horizons. And particularly, we want to go beyond the conventional applications of Gen AI. And uh, we organized this conference around three major questions um, involving science, creativity, and society. So here are the three questions I want all of us to ponder over the course of this conference. So, how can AI provide new windows into nature to un enhance human understanding? How does AI challenge, redefine, and expand notions of human creativity? And how can we envision a flourishing pluralistic society of humans and agents? So to address these questions, we have invited an exciting and diverse set of speakers spanning science, creativity, and society. So Surya can tell us a little bit about the science speakers. Sure. So um, in the first session today, uh, well, actually, more generally, in the context of science, 
AI can really expand human sensation and thought by revealing hidden patterns across biology, physics, climate, economics, and social, and social sciences. And we're, we're excited to explore several of these dimensions today. In the first session, we'll start with um, Alex Reeves, who has developed large-scale language models of protein mm -hmm. amino acid sequences, trained in up to 60, 60 million unique sequences. And he shows that in such a language model, despite being trained only in sequences, they learn representations that are very useful for predicting 3D structures. One might even say that this language model, by deciphering the secret language of proteins, comes to possess an emergent world model of 3D structure, and we'll learn about that. Next, we'll hear from Patusha Sharma, who will also uncover hidden meanings in another heretofore secret language, this time the language of whales, whale communication. It turns out they have an incredibly rich structure of vocalizations, raising many interesting questions. What is the complexity of their language? What are its fundamental invis indivisible atoms of meaning? And can machine translation decipher this language and, and, and teach us what they're saying to each other? And she'll discuss what they've learned so far. And the third speaker of this session is Aditi Shashadri, who's actually a card-carrying specialist in climate modeling with a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from MIT and also a professor here at Stanford. We will see remarkable examples of how her physics-informed approach to machine learning can yield very interesting insights into climate modeling and potentially their impacts on climate change. And also at the end of the day, we're very lucky to have Daphne Kohler, who will describe how a combination of large-scale, industrialized, multimodal biological mm. data collection coupled with machine learning uh, applied to these data sets at scale can make drug discovery faster, cheaper, and more efficient. Yeah, thanks, Surya. So science and creativity go hand in hand because both are about fundamentally discovering something or creating something new. So we often think of creativity as something fundamental to being human, whether you're an artist, designer, mathematician, chess player. Um, but let's think about the goal of AI is, is expanding this creativity. So first we'll hear from Chris Donahue, who will, works on developing AI tools that musicians use to create music. Then we can move to the visual world, where Andrew Kanazawa will describe her work on generating and editing 3D scenes. And then we'll transport ourselves into a very different world of chess. We'll hear from uh, Bean Kim and um, chess expert Elisa Schutt on their fascinating work on using AlphaZero to understand and improve our creativity in chess. So, and finally, we have um, a delightful performance and talk from uh, Ge Wang, who will build tools uh, that helps people create and experience music and always ask the question, what's the point? So what is the point? Um, I think, not yet. Um, I, I think that AI shouldn't just be about making people more efficient, saving keystrokes, although that's, that's good too. I wanted us to think about AI as fundamentally expanding our creativity. So we should think about AI as this alien intelligence that can think of things I know human would. So I'm reminded by this event that happened almost seven years ago, um, which seems like an eternity in AI um, terms. So 2016, AlphaGo and versus LaserDo, seminal game, second game on the 37th move, AlphaGo played a very surprising move that really caused everyone to scratch their heads. People were wondering, what's going on? Was this a, a bug or something? And of course, AlphaGo went on to win that game and then the whole match. But move 37 is now goes down in history. It was the first demonstration of AlphaGo going beyond human play and creating something entirely new. And of course, AI has completely transformed the way that you know, we think about uh, Go. And Fang Hui, a Go professional Go player who advised on the AlphaGo project, later said, it's not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. So beautiful. And so because AI is built differently than humans, of course, I think it can open up new worlds and push us to new heights. So another theme we like to explore is plurality in the context of society. So often we get fixated on AI systems, so individual systems, and if we're lucky, we think about how these AI systems interact with uh, a single human. But so if you look at society, it consists of a large set of humans with different values, different goals. And in the future, these um, humans will be accompanied by you know, sets of AIs. 
And these humans and AIs will interact with each other in all sorts of ways, and there'll be emergent social behavior. So the question for us is, how do we want this world to look like? How can we ensure that the world develops in a way that's fair and benefits the, the humans? So for, to answer this question, we need to not just address the individual system, but to think about the whole ecosystem. So to explore this topic, really excited to have this very interesting and diverse panel. So we have Eric Pernolfsen, who will bring an economics perspective. After all, economists have been thinking about how multiple agents with different goals interact with each other for quite some time now. Jerry Lanier, who has been trying to center the creators of the data that power AI and think about how we can create a more sustainable um, economic model around data and AI. And Jim Park, who has built generative agents based on language models that can simulate in entire society. So this is another microscope that can help us understand the interactions of a society. And Isha Wilson, who has been thinking about algorithmic pluralism and the foundations of fairness for ML systems. So I'm really excited to see where that conversation will go. And uh, last but not least, we have a keynote talk from Shakira Mohammed, which I'll introduce in a bit. Okay, so before we begin, um, we have a few logistics. So for our virtual audience online, um, you can ask questions to the speakers using Slido. You can use the, the QR code on your screen to access Slido, or you can go to the event website as well. Um, Slido has a nice upvote feature, so please use that so we can curate the questions that are most interesting to all of you. For the in-person audience, uh, we will have micro, uh, microphone runners for you to ask live questions, so please um, talk into the mic so that everyone can, including the online folks, can hear you. And then we'll split uh, the QA time between the in-person and virtual audience. Okay, so let's go to our first uh, speaker now. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Shakir Mohammed with us. So Shakir did his PhD at Cambridge, a postdoc at UBC, and then joined DeepMind in 2013. So for those of you who uh, track the, the history of, um, of, of you know, the AI space, will realize that 2013 is very early. So he was part of the you know, OG and at DeepMind, and the, which then became Google DeepMind, and then became DeepMind, and now it's Google DeepMind again, where he's a, a, a research director. Um, Shakir is also a very active member in the machine learning community, having been a co-program chair or general chair for iClear and NeurIPS multiple times. Um, he's on the board of ICML, iClear and NeurIPS, so we really thank him for all your service to the ML community. Um, Shakir's research is quite broad. It was hard to summarize it. Um, he works on everything from probabilistic modeling to applications to healthcare, uh, to the environment, and thinks really critically about how to promote diversity and responsibility in AI. And this is all very convenient because I think you'll have something to say about every three of our topics here. So we couldn't ask for a more perfect uh, opening keynote. Um, and last night at dinner, I learned that this is Secure's first time visiting Stanford. So let's give him a very warm welcome. Okay. I'm just gonna grab some of this. Hello, hello, hello. I'm uh, so excited to be here. Um, believe it or not, uh, as Percy just said, it's my first time here at Stanford. So I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, you are, of course, a community that I don't often get to interact with, but you are also a community that has a great deal of influence on our AI ecosystem. So it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to have this stage today, um, to have this platform to share a few thoughts uh, with you all. And um, I want to express my deep thanks to Surya, to Percy, to Casey, and to all of the other organizers for uh, giving me this gift of experiencing something for the very first time. Um, and of course, a huge thanks to all of you here in this audience, online, and whenever you might be uh, seeing this. So it's this experience of firsts that uh, I want to pick up that I thought we could use as a theme for today and that we're gonna use for our next 20 minutes together. So um, I chose 
to talk today about this title, Responsibilities of the Pioneer, and to then use that to bring all the different themes today together. This title is meant to be a resemblance to an essay by Noam Chomsky uh, entitled The Responsibility of Intellectuals, and I thought that could be a nice kind of side connection for us to work through today. So doing things for the first time, so saying something, writing, coding, um, organizing, deploying, leading. So experiencing things anew is something that's very special in our lives as people and in our experiences. So as we kick off this morning, I would like you to now think of your own firsts. So maybe like me today, the first time you found yourself here on this uh, camp campus of Stanford University. Now, I don't want an unhealthy image of being first in a race to publish or being first to deploy to come to mind when you are thinking about your first. Nor should your, th <clears throat> your thoughts be about winning or getting the top prize or being the top of a league table. Rather, I want our imaginations of first to be directed to things that are new, and previously unknown, and the wonder and the awe of those events and experiences. <clears throat> so our conference today on New Horizons in Generative AI is inviting us to think about the frontier of research and innovation. And right now, especially in this area of generative AI, we are either experiencing newness and first ourselves, or we are actively seeking them out. So in these experiences, I am right there with you, and I'm going to use my time today to connect deeply with this research era, um, which has been such a key part of my work for the last decade. And I'm going to share some of my view of these new horizons, particularly in AI for weather uh, and climate, AI in drama, and uh, AI with social purpose. And I think the rest of today's program and the amazing speakers and audience assembled here will no doubt reveal other aspects of that horizon. But we are not merely passive observers of these new horizons in generative AI. We are also those people who are shaping what that horizon will look like and what that frontier will be. And it's for this reason and for the time of this talk why I'm identifying us as pioneers and identifying us as pioneering. And if we are pioneers, I think that gives us some foresight, some power, and ultimately some <clears throat> responsibilities. So to explore this, I'm going to use two stories um, to brainstorm out loud with you what some of the responsibilities of the pioneer might be. And I hope you will add more of your thoughts when we get to the discussion time. So two stories, one about AI for forecasting the Earth system, and a second story about digital dramaturgy. And these stories are going to expose some features of the socio-technical foundations of generative AI, and that's really going to be my underlying message and call to action today. So on to um, story one, forecasting the Earth system. So I want you to go back in time. The year is now 1922, and Lewis Fry Richardson has just published his book, uh, this is the title you see the picture on the screen, Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. Now, what he doesn't know yet is that this book is going to become a cornerstone of the field on industry of weather forecasting. The centuries before had given Richardson and also us today one of the best exe exemplars of a triple impact domain. So one where research impact, deployment and product impact, and social impact are mutually realized by the search for improved weather forecasts and climate understanding. So as Richardson finalizes his book, he adds to the introduction his vision of a new horizon for weather forecasting. And what he writes about is a vision for the forecast factory. Now, the factory is a building with an enormous central chamber with walls painted to form a map of the globe. A large number of computers, human computers, are busy calculating the future weather. Richardson estimated that 64,000 people would be needed to do the calculations to forecast the changing weather. 
Of course, a factory was the model that um, Victorian era industrialists thought about the world, not unlike the data center or the kind of uh, agent or assistant model that we might be using today. Nevertheless, Richardson's broad strokes vision has been realized and triple impacts are abound. So let me give you one example. Consider that today the three day ahead predictions we have of hurricane, for hurricane tracks are more accurate than the one day ahead forecast we had 40 years ago. And so this technical field has increased both the accuracy and the prediction horizons of its forecast. And at the same time, it enabled all the safety and social benefits that forewarning actually brings. But the frontier of weather and forecasting and climate understanding is always changing. And a major part of the reinvigoration of weather and climate today is because of the advances we are making within AI for weather forecasting and climate. In my view, this is one of the most vibrant and exciting areas that any of us could be working in. And so I encourage you to redirect some of your energy and attention to working this area. So some of the new horizons for weather forecasting came into view a few weeks ago with the formation of a storm system that later came to be known as Hurricane Lee. So the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting has made now available several of a new generation of machine learning forecasts um, based on machine learning approaches for 10 day ahead weather predictions. So we refer to 10 day ahead predictions as medium range forecasting. The availability of these forecasts have now allowed people who work on hurricanes and other extremes to monitor and record the performance of these new machine learning predictions, and specifically two key variables, the uh, wind and the sea level pressure, which are the key variables for analyzing these kinds of storm systems. It's still too early to say anything concrete about machine learning for hurricane forecasting, but I think this social media post says enough for now, in particular highlighting the strong performance of a model that we call Graphcast that I want to tell you a little bit more about. So for medium range forecasting, the prediction problem involves making predictions in six hour intervals, or you could do one hour intervals with a different source of data from six hours ahead up to 10 days uh, ahead at around 25 kilometers spatial resolution at the equator. So in the data we have, every pixel in this grid in the Earth contains five surface variables along with six atmospheric variables at 37 vertical pressure levels. So that's all the way up into the atmosphere. So every pixel then is 227 variables for every grid point. And in total, when you make a prediction of the entire Earth, you have 235,000 variables for each time point that you want to make a prediction for. So this kind of data is one of the largest forms of input data that we would have for machine learning problems. Now, a magic ingredient in all of this is the commitment of international meteorological organizations and their member states to making numerical simulations available for us to use as training data, specifically a type of data that's known as reanalysis data that covers the last 40 years. The aim here is to build the best general use base weather model that we can. This base model is then going to be picked up by other environment agencies or commercial operators for their specific problems. And these problems are many. Renewable energy, logistics, aviation, floods, safety planning, forecasts and warnings, and so, so many more. So once you really address the root problem of dealing with weather forecasts, you unlock many other application areas. And I think that's the kind of impact that we are looking for with uh, machine learning and particularly AI in science. So to show how this works, it's common to produce a scorecard, which is what you are seeing on the screen, that visually summarizes the model performance across different variables, um, and it uses different metrics. So blue squares, when the model is better than the operational system, red squares, when the model is not as good or worse than the operational system. Importantly, these scorecards show you performance across different subsets of the data, like performance for the Southern Hemisphere versus the Northern Hemisphere or other important subsets of the data. So what this scorecard is showing is that machine learning approaches can outperform operational weather systems. And so with this scorecard, we can affirmatively answer that long-standing question of whether machine learning can be competitive with world-leading operational forecasting systems. 
So using graph neural networks, we are able to show state-of-the-art performance that significantly outperforms the most accurate operational deterministic global medium range weather forecasting system on 90% of the 1,380 verification targets that we assessed. This model will also outperform other machine learning based approaches on 99% of the forecast of the verification targets that were reported. And our model can generate a forecast in 60 seconds on a single deep learning chip, which we estimate is one to two orders of magnitude faster than traditional numerical weather prediction methods. And if I had more time, we could talk a lot more about base models for weather like graphcast and how they can be used for forecasting severe events like cyclones, atmospheric rivers, extreme heat and cold, and other kinds of uh, severe events. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that what we have is a replacement for numerical weather prediction, prediction methods and the role of physical knowledge and simulation um, that we have been relying on for the last 100 years. Rather, what's clear from these results and the results of so many groups working in this area across the world, perhaps some of you in this room, is that we are making significant progress in the role of machine learning for weather. We are seeing this in improvements compared to operational forecasts and across forecast horizons. And we hope that this is part of opening and supporting that vital work of weather-dependent decision-making that is so important for the flourishing of our societies. So a quick plug, if you might have work in this general area, please do su consider submitting your work to the ongoing JMLR special collection on machine learning addressing problems of climate change. Now, while so many technical advances continue to be made, another less uplifting story was also unfolding. We are again back in time, this time in 1997 and in Peru. Amazingly, at this time, improved forecasts of El Nino are now available, and with that, a new tool to assess shipping conditions and potential changes in fishing populations in the global ocean. So this is where our story is taking a turn. Fishing companies incentivized by the prospect of a weak season and using such forecasts chose instead to accelerate the layoffs of their workers. So no triple impact here. These improved forecasts have led to demonstrable harms and the opposite of their assumed benefit. So I'll give you a quick second example. Today, the average forecast accuracy for high-income countries is more than 25% higher than the average accuracy for low-income countries, making the problem of forecast equity a distinct challenge for all of us to work and take on. So now we can come to the role of the pioneers who see and make new horizons. Clearly what I'm suggesting is that part of the responsibility of the pioneer is to direct attention to areas with broad societal benefit like weather and climate. But we, are, we should not simply assume that new models of an AI for AI and weather will have a positive impact and be used for outcomes that lead to prosperity. In his essay, Chomsky wrote something very relevant for us, that it will be quite dangerous uh, it will be quite unfortunate fortunate, and highly dangerous if new advances are not accepted and judged on their merits and according to their actual, not pretended accomplishments. So creating the culture for this form of accountability is then one of our responsibilities. So taken together, the responsibility of the pioneer lies in placing AI's technical advances in its broader context of history, variability in prediction quality, limitations in who and how societies access technology, its diverse use cases, and our changing climate. How we discharge this responsibility is itself a new horizon for us to consider. So let's leave behind the weather for a bit, and we're going to move on to a second story. So story two on digital dramaturgy. So it's now 2022, and a series at the Edmonton Fringe is running, and it's called Plays by Bots. The description for the improv series uh, was this. Bots write plays, performers act them out, then they improvise the ending, 
Hilarity ensues. The result is an unpredictable work of human machine co-creativity. You will laugh until your face hurts. Amazing, and actually they got some several five-star reviews out of these performances. So um, the role of AI and generative uh, language models in creative writing fields is, of course, very active. Today, it's one of the most alive topics that any of us could be engaging in. So I thought we could look in particular at the part on dramaturgy and AI for dramaturgy, which is the writing of plays, dramas, and scripts. So one system that you can play with is called Dramatron, which is a compositional use of a text-generating model which is specifically set up for dramaturgy. So Dramatron builds a structural context for a play or a drama via, a prompt, via prompt chaining, at least for now, and aims to generate coherent scripts and plays complete with the title, characters, story beats, locations and descriptions, and of course the dialogue. So this is a description um, that you see on this picture of the hierarchical generating process that starts with the log line that sets the scene for the co-writing exercise and then allows chaining, regeneration, editing, and it provides a co-writing experience. Now, but Dramatron was actually designed to explore a more fundamental question of what artists might actually want from co-writing tools and how artists might participate in its design. So later on in a small conference room, a group of these artists came together to write a script using this system and to situate their practice, their understanding of this technology and their views of their art and industry. So some of the artists would even later stage their co-written scripts. Um, and this group of people, of course, revealed a set of insights that the designers of Dramatron could not themselves have concluded or uh, even be alive to. So some artists saw new modes of interactivity and opportunity, and others exposed its limitations and concerns, or simply concluded that this was not a tool that was something for them to be using. So here's what some of the participants said. In terms of the interactive co-authorship process, I think it's great. You know, with a bit of editing, I could take that to Netflix. Just need to finesse it a little bit. Actually, a lot of the content is misogynistic and patriarchal. AI will never write Casablanca or A Wonderful Life. It might be able to write genre-boxed storytelling. So Dramatron is an ideation and a co-writing tool and I think a good example of taking a people-centered approach to AI, since its success is only possible if people actually find value in this tool. Now, the real story here is about how we can center the needs of different groups of people and different communities in the development of new technical systems, whether that is in establishing better weather forecasts, like I spoke about earlier, and which I could tell you a, a different story about later on, or in creating performance scripts or any of the other areas of application you might have in mind. This way of ensuring that people are owners and shapers of the upcoming horizons is often referred to as participation. Participatory AI is an active area of work and one where there is a great deal of complexity and tension and an area from which all of our work can benefit. Today, screenwriters in some regions have worked through their expectations of working with AI creativity tools and have made clear their demands and constraints on how they want to work with new technologies now and going forward. The truly socio-technical nature of creative AI is fully on display here. And if you are ever confronted with the deterministic uh, the narrative of de technological determinism that is surrounding AI, then this is one story that you should bring up. Because it makes clear that technology's outcomes are never determined or inevitable, and that people and groups together do have agency to actively decide the role and shape of technologies in their lives. So what any maturing field, um, and generative AI is not an exception, um, what any maturing field has is uncertainty. Uncertainty about the path of future technology, its impacts, and its benefits. That uncertainty, uncertainty directly affects how we go about designing and releasing new methods. This is often captured in the famous Colling Ridge dilemma on this tension um, between technological uncertainty and technological control. 
And Colin Ridge uh, wrote in his famous quote, when change is easy, the need for it cannot be seen. When the need for change is apparent, change can become expensive, difficult, and time consuming. Yet what I hope to expose to you with the story of Dramatron's participatory nature is that we need not make a choice between uncertainty and premature action or certainty and expensive action. Participation leads us down a different path that includes people in the design of our methods, allows us to be comfortable with disagreement, and allows us to be open to changing what we work on and how we work based on wider input. Participation changes the nature of how we research, design, evaluate, and deploy machine learning systems, making it people-centered, and turns it into an ongoing process. Participation done well can place our work on stronger ethical foundations by incorporating and accounting for the values of the communities and the societies that we are operating in. There is much newness and many firsts for us in this area and one worth exp experiment, embracing. So taken together, the responsibility of the pioneer is to center people, to rebuke deterministic thinking and to work with uncertainty and in so doing, leave open a multiplicity of future outcomes and new horizons that are possible with AI. So let me bring these two stories together a bit um, as I reach a close. So on to socio-technical foundations. So new approaches to weather forecasting and new approaches to thinking of co-writing are just two of the new horizons in science and creativity and its roles across societies. Of course, these are two wonderful fields with which we can explore the responsibilities of the pioneer. <clears throat> in both climate and creativity, a defining characteristic of the new horizons that I've really been trying to point out is their fundamentally socio-technical nature. And the starting point for the socio-technical foundations for generative AI is an understanding that the social and the technical are interacting and mutually reinforcing. So to expand and discharge our responsibilities, strong socio-technical foundations are needed, where we ask at every stage how people and societies and technology are mutually interacting. Socio-technical AI is all about adjusting and adapting the conceptual apertures we use as we are going about our work. So picking up on the, micro, uh, the microscope analogy from the opening, asking our technical and engineering work to account for a wider and more expansive set of considerations, the telescope model of AI, and to bring focus and manageability to the seeming vastness of social considerations, the microscope model of AI. So socio-technical approaches ask for an ecosystem view and is a way of engaging with that ecosystem. And with this, I'm not only pointing out a recognition of socio-technical thinking, I'm also pointing out a very specific model for responsibility and responsible AI and a firm foundation for it. So let me invoke another line from Chomsky's essay to add one further responsibility. If it is the responsibility of the intellectual to insist upon the truth, it is also their duty to see events in their historical perspective. The responsibility of the pioneer is to create path dependency from the past to the present and for the future. That is a power to direct, create complex couplings between fields and see different kinds of outcomes. Outcomes that consider agency, uncertainty and control, science and quality and access and community-centered participation. So let me end with a few questions. My time is up, but give me two more minutes. So the frontier in weather and climate is one that um, has been reshaped across centuries from initially divining the weather by looking at the stars to the, to the forecast factory and maybe to the forecast assistant and the forecast agent of the future. Today, exciting approaches for weather forecasting are possible globally because organizations have set up a system of open sharing of data, of forecast data. And that means we who have new skills and ideas and curiosities are able to bring our intellectual energy to build on what has come before and add new methods, benchmarks, and technologies. And of course, there's a vast horizon for what still remains for weather and climate. And amongst them, continued innovation in environmental data sharing for public benefit, 
new work and precipitation forecasts, which are a key priority since most models are bad. Rain is actually the hardest thing you can try to predict right now. And then maybe I'll end with seasonal and decadal forecasting that extend forecasts to three to 12 months, which have been very poor historically, but yet there exists many needs for such forecasts. Creativity is just as complex a landscape where technical tools for co-writing are confronted with the needs of people, artists, and the fundamentally human work of enriching our cultures and memory. Creativity provides the perfect environment for socio-technical approaches that are people-centered and opens up the landscape for us to ask much more complex questions. So some of those questions include establishing further participatory and community-centered work that really showcases and enables their effective use. And hopefully as we go more in this next year or two, I'm sure we'll see much more work on human AI interactions, behavioral studies, and evaluations. And what we also need is more historical and decolonial work that continues to provide public memory of what has come before and that will foreground humility and rigor in the work that we do. So I'm going to end here and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. If I have reached my aims, then you got to this point with three key messages. Firstly, the horizon for weather and climate is exciting and changing and full of firsts and new opportunities. AI for Earth Systems is a technically challenging area, one where generative models are proven as a useful approach, creates many opportunities for collaboration and touches upon the entire socio-technical system. You should get involved. Secondly, there is a specific and firm model for responsibility that is built on taking a socio-technical approach to generative AI. This will center the role of people at all stages, create more demanding evaluations, advance participatory methods, and um, establish a more expansive view of safety and benefit. And finally, the responsibilities of the pioneer are ours to take on and magnify. This involves engaging with historical context and path dependency, navigating socio-technical uncertainty, and making our contributions to the advancement of science and directing machine learning towards social purpose. The gift of a first is a special one, and I thank each of you deeply for allowing me to openly brainstorm with you and to publicly hope in this way, my sincere gratitude to you all. A short postscript, here are some resources that might be of interest. And thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Secure, for that inspiring talk. Uh, we have about five minutes for, for questions. Maybe I'll start with one thing. I, I really appreciated the you know, the excitement of weather forecasting and how you could predict hurricanes and how that clearly has a lot of societal consequences, but I really appreciate how you drew attention to some of the inequalities and also misuse. Um, so maybe one question is, uh, what can you do about it? Maybe taking some ideas from a participatory design and thinking about, you know, fundamentally we have dual use technologies is there a path forward to reduce inequality or prevent some of these harms? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> again, the, I guess climate equity or climate justice or environmental justice is a very broad topic. For us, again, to think about our responsibilities as technical designers, there are a few kinds of things we can do. So one area in a different story, which I don't have time today, is the role of weather forecasting is very different depending on whether you and I in our everyday lives, what we are looking for, versus where they actually have the most need in this world, which is for the prediction of extremes. And so these two make a very different point of view. So by working with experts, we can direct some of our work towards the problem of extremes and really improve the quality. And how we do that is then you actually have to work with expert meteorologists, those people who are working in a forecasting center who look at this every day and are making national security decisions. And with those, you can actually do a new kind of design. And then I think the, uh, the big problem here of building global weather forecasting model itself is a good way of trying to address the equity problem because then we can unpack where we have problems of, um, of prediction uh, divergence, particularly because of the nature of sensing data across the world. But what we can also do is make those predictions available to everyone across the world. So if you are in a low-income country, perhaps you don't need to necessarily run those models yourself. We can still access them. And then over time, we can do different forms of sensing. And the power of machine learning, I think, is going to be good. So 
Um, and again, uh, in climate justice, the, some of the papers that I pointed out in climatic change also show there's a role of um, thinking about path dependency, and this is maybe for those of us who are doing more in our policy roles, where you think about the path dependency of technology, its introduction, how it actually gets used, who accesses them, and that thinking of intervening in the path dependency or the path is another way that we can okay. think a little bit more. Great. Let's take a question from the audience. I think back there. Oh. Okay, we'll do up front. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the lovely talk. I had a couple of questions about Graphcast. On a more technical side of things, uh, these models tend to go unstable very quickly, you know, 10 days or so, and I was wondering if you had thoughts on that. And on a more fundamental front, none of these models obey conservation laws. They're completely unaware of Navier-Stokes or anything like it. Yeah. So why should anyone ever take them seriously? <laughs> I think that's the big question in actually the biggest tension of doing work for machine learning and weather and climate is the rightful skepticism of those who are working physical models that can machine learning models. But I've already given you a scorecard that shows that we can beat what is considered today the operational forecasting center. Now, again, I didn't, I specifically said I'm not saying that this is a replacement for physical knowledge, a century of work that we need to do. I think that's part of our new horizons, is to bring those together. And I actually also see what's changing in our practice is a new form of evaluation of these models. So these models, if you run them beyond up to 30 days, they will definitely become unstable. Or if you run them up to 100 days, they will definitely become very unstable. So I've seen some of the evaluations of places running them out, looking to see are they capturing some forms of those physical processes. They can't capture them entirely, but we have other kinds of resources. So I'm excited actually for the new kinds of models that we will build. I think this is just opening a door, that skepticism that we had for many years. I have been working for many years with operational systems and the chief scientist of the Met Office or every senior scientist was like, no, this machine learning is not serious. And you know, now I'm happy to be in a different kind of space where we can have a different kind of productive conversation. And again, it's not because we are looking to replace models. What we need to do is come up with new methods to support that work of weather-dependent decision-making because the work of climate action today demands that from us. And I think that's how we are doing our work of machine learning that is directed towards a social purpose. Okay, great. Let's uh, take one question from the online audience and then maybe one more from the live audience. Um, so the, the question is, how do you balance generative AI and script writing with the demands of SAG-AFTRA? Are you concerned that jobs of writers will be lost, downgraded, or underpaid? Um, <clears throat> can you just repeat one part? Uh, how do you balance the demands of AI for script writing with? Um, let's see. Balance the, I guess, the demands of sag so the writers are demanding, balancing that with uh, presumably the benefits of um, generative AI in, yeah. uh, in script writing. And the fundamental question is, um, what is the impact on this industry of people writing scripts? Yeah, so predicting the future of any industry is a very difficult one, so I'm not going to opine on that. But again, I brought up that explicitly because those communities and groups have come together, they have used the power of collective action and made a decision, and so none of us must go and just declare Machine learning is here to take over your industry, and at the point that I'm really making is that if we took a different path, we engage with those artists, they actually hear something new, and when you do that, the kind of conversation is very different. And you will never get a point where everyone is on board with things. No one is gonna love every, every new tool that you create. So what we need to do is create a space where we can allow for disagreement, can allow for some people to use and others not to use, and then to integrate it in a kind of slow way. Ultimately, this is a question that, the, um, and I really appreciate about how it is we go about building trust in the space of machine learning. And one model that we know from science and technology and its history is that repeatable actions of small, trustworthy actions, that is the way we're going to do that. And so, again, that participatory nature that turns it into an ongoing process that creates small and repeatable and trustworthy actions are sort of one way. And then we can recreate industries if we need to, or we can, again, partner in different kinds of ways. And it's not just a, a battle um, as it unfolds right yeah, now. You have to bring people into a conversation. So one final question, and then we'll wrap up. I think uh, maybe the, the mic is over, over with someone or, over there already. Where is the mic? 
Oh, okay. Why don't you ask the question? The person who has the mic asked <laughs> the question. Thank you. Um, I was fascinated with your call for action for participatory approaches to the future of AI and envisioning AI in our social life. So as a social scientist, we know that um, it, any introduction of any new technology tends to replicate the power dynamics and relationships that existed there before. Yeah. So how do you, what do you think might be a different way forward with AI in particular? Yeah, so this is the big question. I think the famous line is, uh, you create new institutions, and the institution tends to preserve the problems that they were created to solve. And I think that's the uh, question that you are bringing up uh, on. And I don't have an answer to this question quite yet. The problem of, I think what we need to do is, again, understand the, the ecosystem view, that participatory methods are not a universal solution to all the problems of trustworthy and trust building that we need to do. They have a very particular kind of role. And if we can situate that role correctly, particularly in the role of value understanding, what value we give back to participants so that we don't just use them as extractors, then we can set things up. But what we need to be very clear is that participatory methods are not a substitute for things that should happen in a democratic process. So questions of values that we need to decide. And so as long as we keep those things and also manage the burden, um, usually a kind of epistemological burden that we are placing on people. So I'm excited for a few different models that are coming up, particularly around language models and how it is we are speaking to vulnerable communities and using the experience and recognizing different forms of expertise and bringing them into the design process. And then I think there's a bit of humility that's needed as we are changing our practice to then say, actually, we will change change what we work on, but that's going to require a field to make that kind of change, because only that kind of change can come with pressure that comes from a field change. A single organization will never um, quite do that, I think. So but anyway, thank you, and hopefully I can find you after so we can talk a lot more. Yeah, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Uh, hopefully we can continue this conversation uh, throughout the day. So let's thank Shakira again for the wonderful talk. Thank you.